Warning, the following Otaku Generation podcast has content of an adult and mature nature and is not necessarily safe for work or appropriate for children under the age of 18. If you are easily offended by content of this type, please stop this recording. Parental discretion is advised. The opinions and viewpoints expressed on Otaku Generation are those of the cast and crew and the individuals that express them and are not necessarily associated with the sponsors or guests of the show. Otaku Generation is a Red Apple production which is solely responsible for its content. All impressions are poorly impersonated. And please, for the love of God, don't try this at home. And uh, I guess you guys got a double dose of Kyle there. Uh, hi, hello, everyone. I am Alan. I am Matt. And I am Paul. What's Freesh? What's Bang? What's Squeak with the OG crew? Okay, so what did I do? Uh, I did a bunch of car club stuff. Uh, I watched a couple things on Netflix. Uh, okay, hold on. Let me put some preview around that. I watched maybe one thing on Netflix. So I saw this incredibly bad movie pop up on Netflix saying 100% match for you, which is a huge indicator that um, my, my when my roommate used to watch everything on my account on on the uh the the fire tv or the fire cube or whatever it is on 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 the tv so uh so it was a uh very star studded very bad movie that was like hey i am making a quentin tarantino movie but it was not made by quentin tarantino original movie on netflix called uh gunpowder milkshake uh, it's, Karen, it's Karen Gillan in it, a whole bunch of uh, well-known sort of, um, you know, just actors, celebs in it. Uh, mm-hmm. It is just sort of like, oh, my God, I can't believe they made this thing. It is so not not good. <laughs> it's so bad. Not even a good way. Uh, but they made it. And uh, and so I got, I don't know, halfway through it. I was like, okay, I, I'm going to sleep. I, I'm not staying up for this. So uh, so that was one of the things I watched. But then the other one that I watched uh, last night was something called Sweet Tooth. Um, okay. So this is like pandemic happens. 
um, and a lot of people die, and uh, basically uh, a whole bunch of babies were reborn. Any new babies are born are basically what they call hybrids. They're like this sort of animal slash humans. Um, and then there's this particular character. I don't even know if we get his name, um, but we see this character sort of hiking in the woods and he's carrying a sort of a baby pouch in front of him and he's got a hybrid. Uh, this little baby he calls Gus that has antlers. Um, and uh, he's just in the middle of wherever and he just finds a shack and he basically just sort of starts fixing it up and um, I guess he fenced in him and Gus and that is to keep out sort of um, anybody who is hunting down hybrids. Why would somebody want to hunt down the hybrids just, you know, for racial purity or something? I'm not even sure, but I think basically no new babies uh, are not all because of the virus. All new babies are hybrids. Uh-huh. And so I don't know, I'm only one episode and some change into the second one. Um so it's kind of I'm not sure how to feel about it. Um I want to continue to watch more of it. It seems pretty interesting. Um but where it it sort of slowed me down for a moment is that the main guy that we were spending time with that basically um uh was sort of acting as the parent for Gus uh he basically taught Gus how to – he basically is like, you know, is a 9-year-old, 10-year-old kid now, uh, you know, by by the time you get into well into episode one. And um, he taught him to read and write and speak and stuff like that. Um, mm-hmm. But it, but the main character who was doing a really good job acting was Will Forte. And usually any production that I see Will Forte, it looks like it starts out really nice. But then his like weird sense of humor is completely impregnated into the production. And then I just like hate his weird sense of unnecessary humor. And it just like ruins the whole production. Uh-huh. But his presence is only really first episode. So by the time we're in second episode, he's he's not a, a character of concern anymore. So, um, so yeah, I don't know. I'll be I'll be watching that. But uh, but that was it. Those are the the two things. So if you're up for a bad movie, Gunpowder Milkshake. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, it's kind of like. It's not even like a really complete uh, completed world of like John Wick, but mm-hmm. it's something like it. It's kind of like it. It's a bunch of like you know, assassins and uh, it's it, it's not good. It it kind of reminds me of um what was it Hot Times at the Old Royale, um which basically really really wants to be Pulp Fiction but but isn't. Um, it's it's about a bunch of like weird diverse characters showing up at this motel which is on the borderline of two states, and they make a big deal out of this this kitschy little detail and uh i don't know it it just sort of runs around like trying to trying to have like sort of skeevy um interaction skeevy criminal interactions between the characters and and trying to like pull that card of like you know unexpectedly deep character drama from skeevy um cartoonish protagonists and it it doesn't really gel in my opinion this is um there's nothing cheap about the production. So, you know, that isn't a concern, right? They, they filled it up with, you know, again, people who can act. It's cinematic. Um, mm-hmm. You know, there's nothing cheap about the production, right? The execution of this is perfectly okay. It's sort of a really stupid, campy story that you're just sort of thrusted into and then rushed into immediately. It's a movie. So, uh, I don't know. I got like halfway in and I was tired. So I was like, I'm, I'm going to sleep. So maybe I'll finish it. I don't know. I just, I just was like, Ben walks in and I, uh, he's like, what are you watching? I go, I found a really bad movie that is in the exact pocket of everything you love. And he looked mm-hmm. at the screen for half a second and heard, and he's like, oh yeah, I would like that. I go, yep. <laughs> it's <laughs> such a bad movie. You would love this movie. You got to watch this movie. He's like, all right. <laughs> So that's that's where where I left it with him. Um, yeah. So anyhow, so anyhow, so Sweet Tooth is kind of interesting, and that's it. Those are all the things for me. I I spent a lot of time Minecrafting. 
Um, I just been building up a particular village that I sort of secured. I built a second, not built. I secured a second village that I happened upon, and then I just basically secured it up. And then I just sort of have been grinding and sort of uh, building enough XP to like you know level up villagers so that I can get good deals and get good like special things from them and stuff like that in the game. Those are fundamentally where I've been spending a lot of my time aside from work and and editing. So, Matt, what about you? Unfortunately, I can't really think of anything that's like really new that's happened to me. I've just been not really uh, all that much that's like interesting for other people. Did I mention that I saw the Black Widow movie? Mm -hmm. I did see that. So yeah, and I I saw it as well. Um, I I paid for it on Disney Plus, so I guess now I own it. I, I don't think it was a bad movie. I mean, a lot of people mm -hmm. are like. I asked a coworker, and she's like, she saw it, right? And I said, okay, what'd you think? And she's like, this is an alright movie. Like, she didn't have a lot of enthusiasm about it. So, like, I don't know if that's generally her take on all, all things Marvel, but, she, you know, she went out of her way to pay for it. So, I don't think it was a bad movie. I think mm -hmm. it, it introduces new characters that are going to come together. Um, I'll tell you the one thing in my TikTok, my sort of my For You page, um, is filled a lot of with all these MCU and all these very thing, very specific things where people are like, I just, I just realized this one thing, and then they describe this thing inside of you know three minutes. I think Matt, this is sort of like a thing that you would you would sponge up like there is no tomorrow, <laughs> um, because someone in Loki, there's this uh, this thing called the TVA, right, um, and. Someone the Tennessee says Valley Authority. What was that? The Tennessee Valley Authority. No, uh, Time Variant Authority. I think is oh. what it is. So, uh, and someone took the logo and turned it upside down, and it says Val. And if you know what that means, Val has been showing up in all these sort of spinoffs, and uh, definitely shows up at the end of Black Widow. <laughs> Oh, okay. Yeah, so I mean, there's just lots of these little Easter eggs. All of these little things are littered through all these, uh, you know, these extra MCU things they've been doing, and including in into the movies. So uh, I don't know. So that, some of that stuff is like bad. If you were just if you were on a TikTok and you were to solve the stuff, you would just be on it for hours. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, we were still on you. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that's that's okay. Um, I guess we should just go on to Paul, and if I think yeah. of anything later, I'll I'll chime back in. Okay, Paul. Ah, uh, yes. What have I been doing? So, actually, I was watching some anime this past week. I discovered a show that released in February, so it uh, slipped in between our season impressions, and I noticed it was on Netflix and watched a few episodes of it. So it is Kyo in Kyoto. All right. So it is uh, about a couple of girls uh, who are, well, one of the girls is a Mako. She is training to become a, a geisha. Mm -hmm. And and her friend, who had also gone with her to Kyoto for the same training, but proved to be exceptionally clumsy in every respect. Uh, so she does the oh. cooking. And so she, but she's actually really, really, really good at cooking. So this is almost more of a cooking show than anything else. So Kyo, uh. the the chef for this um, this geisha training house, is um, is um, you know just really wants to support her friend in any way possible. Um, and there's lots of good shots of food, lots of good shots of cooking. Uh, it's not quite slice of life. Um, there's a lot of details about, you know, what it's like to be uh, a Mako mm -hmm. or a Mako. And, um, and yeah, it's um, really, uh, I think, quite promising from these first uh, couple of episodes that I watched. Uh, Mako, excuse me. And uh, let's see, on the gaming front, um, so I've been uh, trying out a few new VR titles, uh, among mm -hmm. them uh, Fisherman's Tale. I don't think I talked about this one because I mostly played it during uh, during our impressions when we don't do what's fresh. So, yeah. so this is a VR puzzle game. 
And in this game, you are a little wooden puppet of a fisherman who gets up every day and brushes his teeth and puts a log in the fire and dusts his little shell and works on his model of the lighthouse. And then one day something strange happens Mm. and you lift the lid off of the little model of the lighthouse and lo and behold, the the lid is lifted off of your building at the same time. And you are in an infinite regress of lighthouses. Um, So there's there's a giant you outside and a little you inside the model of the lighthouse. Uh, Which is, it's... That, that so that first section is super well executed. It's got a narrator with a very thick French accent. Um, sadly, the uh, you are not a regress, an infinite regress of lighthouse keepers. There's just uh, uh, two additional copies of you, uh, one oh. smaller and one larger. And the puzzles uh, are, are revolve around scale. So, so so you'll reach into the model to take something out and put it in your current space where it's small and so on or Uh or vice versa or there's a gigantic anchor blocking a door so you reach into the model and move it and uh, lo and behold a giant hand comes and moves it out of your space Uh and it's a really promising start it's not a long game and unfortunately it has a couple of great set pieces uh, but the ending is just uh, it's almost what the fuck mm. um, there's a sort of a, a, a nasty sequence where the fisherman is talking to someone who is possibly his father and the father is just like constantly abusive about how disappointing this fisherman doll is to him oh. and it's just like a, it goes on and on and so despite the fact that the, that's one of the best puzzles in the game where you've got a, a crane and a ship you're trying to construct out of pieces that are in different scales Uh, But the last one where you're trying to actually light the lighthouse is just an exercise in frustration. Mm. Uh, They change the rules. Um, You can't actually see the giant hand in your current space. Uh, The little models are um, reflected. Uh, so they're they're moving in mirror motion and so it it was such a good start but they weren't actually able to develop it into uh just into what i would call a good game yeah i was Uh, gonna say this sounds really interesting until you just gave that description yeah i mean it was so i mean I, i loved it at the start i mean it was so stylish so clever um you know the the puzzles were fun but they were all then sort of basically they had one puzzle that you did in slightly different ways and there were clever bits, but oh, it's, it's, so it's a real sort of lost opportunity and it felt rushed out the door. Uh, the, the, the final uh, sort of end sequence, it's just like, what the fuck was that? I mean, mm-hmm. I, I can't even uh, tell you exactly what that was supposed to be from a story or a theme perspective. Um, not sorry to have played it. I mean, I got it in like a, pack of cheap uh, VR puzzle games, so it's not like I found yeah. anything. And it was a fun experience. And it was short, so I finished it, which is always a plus. I mean, it didn't, didn't stay on forever, and uh, we're at its welcome. Uh, the other VR game I'll mention that I've tried out is To the Top. So okay. this is a climbing game. And it's actually almost more of a parkour game, I'd say. So uh, more or less, you're in these sort of stylized spaces. There's bits that are certain colors you can grab onto by reaching your hands toward them. And you can go hand over hand. But the really clever bit is if you grab onto something with both hands and let go, you jump at high speed in the direction that you're looking. Okay. And you, so, so it's very natural. You don't have to actually move around much. It's just turning your body and you're reaching. So uh, the, your reach extends beyond your hands a bit. So, you know, you don't ha- it doesn't have to be right there. So you can reach out and grab something. So, and, and if you sort of catch on to something and give yourself a push while, while you're um, in motion, you keep going even faster. So oh. it's all about staying in motion. It's about speed running. I mean, it's, it's probably the most exhilarating VR game that I've played. And it is 
moderately nauseating over a period of time, uh, not excessively <laughs> so. Uh, I'm, I'm definitely getting better on the, the VR sickness front. Uh, it took a, after about a half hour of gameplay, I'm like, you know, I should probably stop this now. And I was only mildly, uh, you know, at disease, but um, just a absolutely fun game. I have to say the environments are really varied, lots of different types of jumping and climbing to do. Uh, there are little crystal spheres you need to hit on the way by to get points. Mm -hmm. uh, you get medals for how fast you make it through the levels to score. Um, and as you accumulate them, uh, you unlock more uh, environments. I'm not super far into it, uh, but I think this one's a definite recommend if you've got a, a compatible headset. Oh, okay. It, while you were you were talking about this, it made me think mm. of a game that we play at VIX when we're all together. Um, have you heard of the game called Mount Your Friends? I have heard of Mount Your Friends. I have not played it. That's and a, then I thought, yeah. I hope that they didn't make a VR version of that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's where yeah. my head went when you were describing this game. Yep, I can see that. Um, I Perhaps the devs will, will get themselves. Oh, I uh, hope not. <laughs> I don't know what you're grabbing on to. Yeah. Yep, yeah. Well, I think the problem is, of course, uh, getting that many uh, VR headsets for a multiplayer party game. Is tricky. Oh, sure. So, right. Yeah. So I, I think the best sort of party VR game I've heard of is... Um, Keep talking and nobody explodes, uh, okay. which I have not played, but Bryce has played. Yeah, so basically, you've, you've got one player who's got a headset and they can see a bomb, mm -hmm. and the other player or players have to talk them through. It. And this is done by yeah. an actual three ring binder or a PDF or, you know, an actual printed book you have to flip through. So the person has to describe on the fly what they're seeing. Mm -hmm. Oh, there's a red wire. And the other person's, oh, okay, you have to do this. You have to hold this down while moving this right. this way. Uh, so so it's, a, it's a very clever concept. There's some clever concept games like that for the multiplayer where you have this sort of mm -hmm. asymmetric thing going on. But I think that's definitely mm -hmm. one of the most interesting. Right, yeah. So the person is describing what to do uh, to defuse the bomb, because that was the phrase I couldn't think of. Mm, right, um, yeah. And the person wearing the headset can see all of the bits. So, yeah. Huh, interesting. Yeah, a but cool I mean, it's, it only really works. I, I guess you could have a room full of people who are yelling at you. I mean, I suppose <laughs> you could do yep. that, but like two people is probably all you need. The probably, ideally, yeah. Yeah. So. Okay, so anything else to mention? Oh, I guess there is one thing to mention, and that is I have been watching some of the uh, 1983 Filmation He-Man and the Masters of the Universe series, uh, which somebody has posted in its entirety on YouTube. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, um, so this uh, is... Is this... Uh... Is <laughs> this is how you torture yourself? Yeah. Um, Netflix has a new one. It's well, that was so, and, and the new one is theoretically a continuation mm -hmm. of the quote story unquote of the original uh, toy marketing. Isn't show. it a prequel to the original Seaman or something like nope, that? Nope, it is. I believe I believe it's described as a direct continuation. So it takes the unfinished uh, stories of these characters, such as they are, and sort mm -hmm. of takes them the next step forward. So Tila, warrior princess, is now the new man at arms of Castle Grayskull. Mm. Uh -huh. Or the, the uh, of Eternia, I guess. They also so. had um before this, they had a very good uh She Ra um original series they did. I, I don't know if it was a 20, 19, 2019 to twenty twenty thing or if it was a twenty twenty thing, but um, I heard a lot of good things about she -Ra. Yeah, it's uh, very well re regarded. I have not mm -hmm. watched that. I also uh, never watched any of the original cartoon as a oh, kid. Oh, okay. That, okay, so. I understand. I watched it so. as a kid. Um, yeah. And even then, I think it was in reruns at that point. I don't yeah, even yeah. know if it was, like, brand new. Um, so... I don't know. I mean, I'm generally interested, but I mean, I wasn't well invested. It was the no. thing I watched. I knew yeah. even as a kid, it was a terrible show. It was a terrible <laughs> animation. It was a terrible show. Everything was lame about it. Um, you know, I played with friends because he had all the toys. You know, that, that was it. That 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 was my only kind of connection to it. Like, it was not 
good. I was not nostalgic about the idea of rewatching it or having <laughs> to watch the rebooted version or whatever a a um, a sequel or something you know to it on Netflix. Uh, I'd be no, curious, indeed. but I'm not sure that I would invest a lot of time in it. Yeah, it was it was more to sort of remind myself. So it wasn't one. So I was not. I, I think we talked about this at an after the show at one point. So I. Um, yeah, a couple of months back, we did the cartoons. So as I said then, I was not actually allowed to watch cartoons as a kid. I was, allow- <laughs> I was allowed to watch Sesame Street and Mr. Rogers, and the electric company was just too out there. So that was fair boat. Oh, you got to draw the line someplace. Exactly. I mean, really. And then on special occasions, uh, which I forget which night of the week it was, uh, probably Friday, we could watch uh, The Muppet Show followed by The Love Boat. Oh yeah, and we were actually allowed to watch the Love Boat, but not Fantasy Island. Uh, but nonetheless, the TV was in the basement, which meant that uh, the proctoring of the TV was not well enforced. So it was possible to go down on Saturday mornings and watch the shows, which I have very little positive memories of. Uh, I just remember them as being almost universally terrible. Uh, but there was sort of a, 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 a fascination to them, nonetheless. Oh, and was this I, the, uh, the era when basically the only children's programming were like half hour long toy commercial properties? Oh, yes, very much so. Right. Uh, that is basically our childhood. Yeah, Matt, in cartoons. <laughs> well, the thing was, before that, before that era began, God knows the children's programming out there wasn't great, but it at least wasn't just a shill for plastic novelties. It was, you know, formulaic, simple-minded, cheaply produced children's entertainment. But at least it was original, simple-minded, hmm. cheaply produced children's entertainment for to- from toys. distinct from toys yeah uh and uh i don't know if transformers was the start of the trend but it it certainly was well into that so gi joe i guess maybe maybe that's what it was Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah and that and definitely i was reading up a bit on the history of he-man and it was indeed originally uh, pitched from the toy as the starting yeah it was it was definitely toys oh yeah that's how i knew it because again my friend dave uh, his mother liked yard sales, and she would go. That's a thing she'd do on the weekend, and uh, he get a bunch of new toys. And this was all new to us, and so we would play with it. Uh, he had a He Man, and uh, the, his uh, was I forget his cat that he you know he had that. I'm afraid it's just Battle Cat or battle, Cringer. Yeah, cringer. Cat, yeah. cringer. And I'm afraid cringer. I know this all too well, having watched uh, several or at least a dozen episodes. Yeah. Good God, have I actually watched a dozen episodes? Anyway, I was interested in checking it out because of the new series, obviously, but also because there were a couple of writers who worked on the original show, including J. Michael Straczynski hmm. of Babylon 5 hmm. and, wow. and Paul Dini, who did uh, Batman the Animated Series. And at this point, I am probably... Uh, better served by looking up the actual episodes they wrote as opposed to watching all 104 <laughs> episodes of oh God, whatever it is. There's two, too, so. there's two seasons that are, are longer than a year. Yeah. Um, so, so I have to say that it is not as inane as I was expecting. It's pretty inane, don't get me wrong. But, um, you know, that's, uh, the, the, the morals are not quite as pat as they as they might have been expected because of course every show at this point had to have a remember kids you know Mm -hmm. orco just wanted to impress people but if people Mm -hmm. could be impressed by giving them something aren't really your friends and and most of them are indeed on that level um and the animation is crap i mean it's crap on toast obviously Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but nonetheless sort of the idea of those stylized sci-fi landscapes is um I mean, there's there's interesting elements to it, the way it still distills down some of the science fiction tropes and also just, you know, the utter mercenariness of the show's conception, uh, but also the way it sort of managed to seep into popular culture. I mean, it's hardly the most enduring of properties, uh, but, you know, it lingers. I mean, you know, Skeletor is still a known figure. Uh, yeah. He-Man is uh, yeah, the subject of many memes, nonetheless. Yeah. 
still uh, defiantly heterosexual oh, oh yep that's what yep that's totally the case absolutely 100 percent the case the he-man corporation would like to vehemently vehemently deny rumors of homoeroticism in its art style and character design Mm, but and he he does have that uh, sort of Clark Kent level disguise going on, where you know he has a slightly darker shade of hair and takes his shirt off as He Man. So uh, I'll tell you, the cartoon did nothing for the toys. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was very popular. I mean, I think it did yeah. actually move a lot of toys mm -hmm. at the time. I mean, I know they were, we were know, well featured. We were not. I mean, we, uh, we were not very smart. <laughs> <laughs> we were in my household. We were not allowed allowed to own he-man of course yep. our masters of the universe we were allowed to own legos which actually was not bad yeah i, did I not like disagree legos. with this as a choice but they didn't I did have, have a, a couple of star wars action figures they so. didn't have a legos cartoon i mean they do for younger generations now there are definitely kids who are growing up and probably going to college that you know that they had their lego cartoons or whatever cutscenes and games so like mm -hmm. you know they they had their sort of opportunity to see their legos animated but you know, as a kid, nope, didn't have any of that. Mm -hmm. It was just not a thing. So, so anyway, I, yes, that's what I've been doing. I've been watching He Man. I'm not proud of it, but I'm also, you know, not feeling too terrible about you know spending a little bit of time, you know, revisiting this period of entertainment history. It's uh, you know good to sort of see it, and I'll be interested to actually watch a couple of the. Uh, intervening series episodes as well just to compare them there was like a 2002 series uh there was the uh, ill-favored movie oh there and, was. Uh, okay. yeah, yeah it does not have a good reputation i i don't know no uh not probably won't watch that but then you never can tell i, I mean, you know this i haven't really been listening but i haven't heard anything super bad about the um the netflix series hmm. so well the the trailer uh that came out a while back which is the only bit of it i've seen thus far i uh, was clearly heavily anime inflected yeah mm -hmm. i mean the the design the animation so much about it was very clearly driven by sort of anime aesthetic so i'm, I'm curious to see how it's synthesized i mean i don't necessarily have super high hopes but uh i think there's only five episodes out when i checked uh, so they're breaking it up into into chunks for release i guess a compromise from their normal you have to binge it all schedule hmm. uh so so yeah it'll be be curious to see that so perhaps by next week but perhaps not we'll have to see how this week goes yep. and that is it for me okay um before i forget new con luke uh so new con luke came out episode 201 so two weeks ago was their episode 200. Very interesting stuff. Very, I mean, it was a long episode, but they packed in a lot of um, interviews and conversations. It was good. Uh, I finally got through that. I have not even, even I haven't listed episode 201. It's, it's still too new for me. Mm -hmm. I haven't had a moment to, uh, you know, squeeze that in. Um, but there you go. Okay. Uh, let's talk about our topic this week, which is... Which is Pokemon Mewtwo Strikes Back evolution okay what do we need to know where shall we start is sort of the first thing uh, i want to make one comment i wrote something down and maybe this is just a good starting point I, don't get me wrong this is just it's not me being mean it's just sort of my little quip about it and there's a lot more to the movie than just this but i wrote down mew levels up to mew 2 gets mad the movie <laughs> No, no, that you're missing the deep theme of this movie, which is that they were so busy asking if they could make the most powerful Pokemon in the world. They didn't stop to ask if they should make the most powerful Pokemon. That's in the world. right. Anyway, oh, so yeah. to, if you're not familiar with this, as I was not familiar with this before watching it for this week's show, this is basically a, a CGI remake of the very first Pokemon movie in which it is described as literally a shot for shot remake but using cgi um and the basic and, idea and the is first that, movie is literally called pokemon the first movie so there we go i mean yeah advertising um, uh yeah basically a, a science expedition discovers a temple in the jungle for like the legendary greatest pokemon mew and they uh rather facetiously do a uh, 
Jurassic Park on a fossil they find of allegedly of, of a Mew no. Pokemon from the ancient past. And they, they, of course, can't leave well enough alone. They're going to clone it into the modern world. And then they're going to beef up its powers and abilities because apparently Mew is like super powerful to begin with. And they're like, well, you know, seeing as how Team Rocket is paying the bills for this expedition, we're not just going to recreate an ancient Pokemon. We're going to recreate a super studly, powerful version of an ancient Pokemon. And with and we're going to give it some thick thighs, man. Yeah, I'm. I'm not sure how accurate their uh, their their cloning process is because when when you have like the conflict between an actual Mew and Mewtwo at the end of the movie, the actual Mew is kind of small. It's a little you know cat like creature, but with like a long, silly looking tail. And Mew, in contrast looks kind of like a kangaroo on steroids or something. Uh, the Mewtwo does. And uh, I'm like, if you were trying to go for the for the Mew, you like totally missed the boat on this, guys. I mean, I don't e even see how making it, quote, more powerful would really result in this. Yeah, and, and I, I have to say that the exposition at the start of this movie is really whack. I mean, everybody talks about how great the Pokemon universe would be to to live in if you had to pick one, because you know, it, you're you're just it's just you know, kids going everywhere, and Pokemon are your friends, and you can just wander around the world and have Pokemon battles, and it's great. Uh -huh. And uh, and as Mewtwo, you know, turns on on its creators, you know, the one dude comes up and says, well, you know, what you really need to do is fight wars and dominate the world for us. And, you know, that's uh, pretty, <laughs> pretty rough. And the lesson Mew takes from this is, you know, well, fuck you, but also fuck the world. Yeah. Uh, apparently some of Mew's backstory development, which was included in, um, in, in the, the, the first movie original version uh, where Mew, you know, like talks to a girl, like a, like Frankenstein, he does not actually kill the girl, which is mm. a, a, a deviation from the source material clearly. Uh, but in, in this one, nope, he just uh, immediately goes on a rampage and he is going to dominate both the humans and the Pokemon because they all suck. Yeah, basically, they they succeed in creating an ultra powerful Pokemon monster, except that Mewtwo like wakes up in a tube in a science lab, and as opposed to getting any kind of like you know nurturing or caring interaction or mothering by anyone or anything, it's just a whole bunch of scientists who are like, "Yay, we've created." a super pokemon and he's like oh so that's me is it and they're like oh yes you are indeed the world's most powerful pokemon and you know mewtwo is sitting here with like like what is life what is existence who am i where do i fit into the world and they're just like nattering on and on about combat bonuses and shit like that and he's like well you people are assholes so I'm the most powerful thing you've ever seen. <laughs> yep, guess I was the most powerful thing you'd ever seen. How about that? And uh, later on, he, he kind of like gets recruited by uh, the Rocket Corporation to basically do dirty jobs for them with his uh, telekinetic abilities and psionic powers. And Wait, no, no, I, I don't think he's working for, for Team Rocket. I mean, Team Rocket seems actually totally super numerary to this this movie as, well i don't mean the, the team rocket tell. that we know from the series i mean the rocket corporation which is behind them ah i see got it which is a, a, a much larger more grown up and more inimical um organization than the the like slapstick antics of jesse and james and and meowth portray they're they're basically like sort of like the least useful um group of agents that that the rocket corporation has and so their their ba their basic job is to not you know 
annoy people at Rocket Corporation headquarters, and so they run around annoying Ash and Misty and Brock. Um, and then after Mewtwo blows up the, the science lab, um, the head of the Rocket Corporation you know, approaches him and basically just feeds him some lies to, to make him join up with, with the Rocket Corporation and, and do dirty business for them. Like there's, there's this one scene where basically the Rocket Corporation is, is terrorizing a bunch of like Buffalo style Pokemon and panicking them into a stampede and then Mewtwo is telekinetically lifting them up so a bunch of like fledgling team rocket wannabes can can capture them all in pokeballs and it, it just strikes me as a a perversion of of like what the the purpose of of pokemon is supposed to be about which i guess was the point but instead yeah. of these young people setting out to to forge their own destiny by befriending and fighting Pokemon together. It's just like, yeah, here's a whole bunch of Pokemon, throw them in the little balls, and let's get moving. Uh, so after our initial setup, we get th closer to something which is the structure of the original series, which is Ash and his two friends, uh, uh, Brock the sexual harasser and Misty. And they are just like hanging out, having a picnic and having a Pokemon battle with some random dude who happens up in his herd of ash. Who looks uh, like they a get hippie. This, yeah, yeah, that's uh, with an odd, an odd fight, though. If you look at the characters in the actual games, they are often odd birds of various sorts, uh, just hanging out, ready to have Pokemon battles with any kid that happens along. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think uh, I don't think Ash gets the traditional payout of uh, funds after losing this match, though. Uh, however, they get uh, an invitation from a mysterious Pokemon trainer. Dun dun dun! And and our uh, Nebishi team rocket of Jesse James and Meowth are you know get a hold of sort of a copy of hey, there's something happening on this island, and so everyone is headed to the island in order to find out what's up. Yeah, um, and so basically, once they they get in the proximity of the island. Um, it turns out that Mewtwo has been sending out these organ uh, these invitations to a lot of different Pokemon trainers because they they get to the the training gym that's closest to the island, which is like in the middle of this big harbor, and uh, and they're just like, oh my gosh, look at all these other Pokemon trainers here. This place is like stuffed to the gills, and uh, Meowth or not Meowth, Mewtwo whips up a telekinetic hurricane surrounding his island which coincidentally is the base where he massacred all of the researchers who created him ha 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 um it turns out that anybody who is deterred by the mere thought of being prevented to going to the world's greatest pokemon trainer by a simple hurricane doesn't deserve to meet the world's greatest hurricane you know pokemon trainer so um, it turns out that just the hurricane itself is a challenge. And so by the time they get to the island, of course, our protagonists manage to make it along with Team Rocket. Um, it turns out that there's only, what is it, like four teams of Pokemon trainers left. There's their team and then like three, three, three other guys. People, yeah. yeah, two guys and a girl with, of course, their various Pokemon collections and then Mewtwo reveals himself and uh, they, they make a big deal out of like, you know, the philosophical basis for like why Mewtwo is a bad person and, you know, why he's, you know, hassling all these Pokemon trainers, etc., cetera, et cetera. Um, But it just seems like it, it, it isn't really well developed to my mind in the story. Um, it, it's just sort of like, okay, Mewtwo has, has got all you guys on his island, so 
this is a Pokemon movie, so now y'all are going to fight. You know, step up, Pokemon. Step up and die. And, uh, I mean, Mewtwo has his own batch of Pokemons, and then he clones all of the Pokemons that the other people brought to the island, and then, for some reason, the clone Pokemon fight the original Pokemon well, I don't know, Mewtwo is, is trying to discover some higher truth from this, I guess. Yeah, there's a sort of a, a psychic battle that it acts, uh, that it emerges as, as Mewtwo is discovered, or excuse me, as Mew is discovered to be in the vicinity. And so Mewtwo uh, determines there can be only one most powerful Pokemon. And in the sort of psychic uh, overspill from their fight, all of the Pokemon and their clones have to battle each other to an exhausted standstill. Uh, wow. With only a couple of them, uh, Meowth, uh, who is basically super lazy and doesn't feel like fighting with himself, and Pikachu, who just you know hugs his 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 rival version of himself, who is sadly slapping him with all of its pathetic strength and then supporting it so it can stand up to, until it can slap again. Uh, yeah. Um, so yeah, so that's the that's basically the plot we've got going on here, and we get to the important lesson that the most powerful thing in the world is Pokemon tears. And you know, if I were an evil corporation, that's what I would be going for. I mean, that is the lesson I take away from. If we can just get the Pokemon to cry a lot, we can do something with that man. Well, but they can only do virtuous things with their with their Pokemon tears. Mm. That's until until we get the, uh, the the overwhelming power of science turned on this problem. Nothing uh, can possibly go wrong with this plan. The irony, uh, the irony is this is not only a kids game; this is a series for kids. Well, this is this is not a a, a deep show. I mean, you know, it has a little bit of darkness in it. It's got a bit more going on than your average episode of Pokemon, I'd say. But you know, this is more or less uh, you know in line with the types of plots you get in the. Uh, in the main series where you've got a big corporation that's trying to exploit all the Pokemon and take the Pokemon away from people. But the power of, you know, your friendship with your Pokemon will nonetheless cause them to triumph and also being a superior Pokemon trainer. And so, yeah, so I guess that leads us to the visual style of this production. Yep, this is CGI animated. It's pretty obviously CGI animated. And I'm not really sure that even if the original movie was made 20 years ago, that remaking it in CGI particularly added a whole lot to what I consider the core elements of the story, which is the character animation and the the you know characters storytelling um because they they seem pretty wooden characters the animation doesn't strike me as particularly evocative of of anything in particular um i mean when you're doing stuff with hand animation even if you're like really skimping on the frame rate you kind of have like this this sense of motion and personality derived from the kinesthetics of the characters that that really contributes a lot to who those characters are and uh in, in contraposition to this, I just want to mention He-Man, the filmation version, which does not hold up that theory, but please go on. Well, there is a point where you can like make it to so cheap that, that you can't stylize it anymore. Um, again, see also, also filmation Star Trek, the animated series, yeah. where everyone had the exact same run cycle. And mm -hmm. it was not a, a well-time-sliced <laughs> um, run cycle either. No, there is a, there is a degenerate bottom to 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 that 
uh, to that scale. Yeah. But yes, so I mean, so in the individual designs, I think are rather good. I mean, you look at stills from this, I think they're often quite pleasing. I mean, the Pokemon have nice 3D character designs. Um, I don't know that they necessarily add a lot over the 2D drawings, uh, but they look fine. Yeah, they're, uh, they're modeled well, but it's it's always the the animation, the motion that makes or breaks um, hmm. an animated feature, particularly a CGI animated feature. Um, I think that's where, where Pixar really does good work in that they will obsess about you know nuance of expression and of motion and not just about okay we have a character design okay we have a plot let's uh ren let's you know slap down some like laundromats and uh, train stations and have the characters wave their arms around and flap their lips while positioned within those backgrounds um it's it's a whole lot of expressing personality through movement that that you really got to lean in on on cgi animated features and i i i just didn't get that coming out of this pokemon movie no i i it was not as bad as it could have been i mean i've certainly seen much worse this is not to the level of like the the awful Netflix uh, supported animated or uh, Netflix supported anime we've been seeing. I guess this one was Netflix, uh, yeah. but the sort of two D the when the three D CG shows that are intended to be to look like two D, uh, those can often be just dreadful. Uh, this is not to that level. No. Um, okay, so let we've said it before a lot of times. Uh, we've seen worse. But also, let's be honest, it wasn't great either. Yeah, I, 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 I wasn't ripping my eyes out when watching this. Though. No, I mean, this no, was no. this you, was a, this was an adequate piece it. of entertainment. I yeah. mean, you can watch it, you can get through it. Um, I think, I think, Pokemon lends itself okay, pretty good, well in two D format. I don't think we needed this. I think that's the the big point. We didn't need a 3D CG version of it. I just we just didn't need it. It's not so, necessary. And, and, and the the sort of weakness of the underlying material is highlighted here. I mean, this is not a great story, and sort of the level of the writing for the uh, for the the translations uh, we watched the subtitled version uh, is not great. I mean, it is very stilted, very clunky. It sticks pretty close to the literal Japanese. There's been zero effort to you know make it flow or feel natural. Perhaps the dub version improves on that. Uh, um, actually, I watched the dub version. Oh, did you? And, okay. Um, it did not really seem to to add any depth to it. Mm, yeah. It it felt like they were very deliberately matching a well like the tone of a children's animation show and there there was not a, a lot of vermicillitude and and depth of characterization as a result of that. Mm. Um, in fact that actually um, kind of reminds me of something that that I feel is is cogent to discussing this movie, which is um, Pixar's The Good Dinosaur, where you had kind of the stylistic mismatch between cartoony protagonists and an exceptionally well-realized and realistic natural world. And I think you you see the same sort of disconnect in in this movie as well as in in that one where the character designs and the pokemon are are kind of cartoony they're they're very much derived from that sort of like manga 2d anime hand-drawn style economy of of featured features and details and you can tell they're sort of like simple simple designs that have been sort of Uprezzed and polished and and like you know re-engineered to be perfect except that they're not perfect they're they're simplified cartoon character designs and they don't look right um 
when they're rendered at like four times their normal resolution they're they're designed to be low res you know and communicate character and style and form in that way and just you know having super high resolution computer versions of them doesn't really enhance them because you're still trying to to live in the world of of that 2d anime that this is coming from and when you're doing 3d you've got you know all of your in-betweens being automatically generated by the computer you've got resolution out the wazoo you've got subtle flowing textures and naturalistic light and if you're not taking advantage of all that what's what's the point of doing it in cgi in the first place i mean what's what's the point of having a photorealistic world with basically these like you know low res ports of of you know low res of low res character designs wandering around and doing stuff in it yeah i mean i would guess that it has a lot less to do actually with you know a a desire to actually see it in 3D CG. I think this was more of a transformative effort so that, you know, copyright renewals in this format uh, or an animated format is probably could be renewed. Um, I don't know why this was the decision path. Not 100% sure. I mean, obviously Netflix is paying for it, uh, I would assume. Um, I don't know. I think the the question that you're asking is does it lends itself to be in 3D CG and I also made the statement earlier I don't think so. I just no. don't think we needed this. Could you redo it in in a more kind of current animation format? Sure. Could you have, I mean it already technically is anime so there's no real style that you can lend it to that's going to make it um give it an edge. Um I could uh, I could see this as like maybe the Pokemon people wanting to transition into a 3D CG model of production in the future. And then they're like, okay, high concept. We'll redo the first Pokemon movie using the new CG technology. And uh, if that makes, makes it a really great movie, then it is an omen for our future path and you know the the technology is the is the way to go but watching it it doesn't really seem to to indicate that to to me it just sort of is remaking an old movie using new technology and it's it's not really to the benefit of the old movie or the technology to do it that way mm -hmm. uh, I mean, and you know like what would happen if you put it in the hands of a studio like, you know, Pixar? What would it look like? How would it come out? How would it be improved? And so you got to ask yourself that question. I go back to, well, I mean, how how good of a job was done for Detective Pikachu? And I think the answer was really good. This is not that kind of level of animation. Uh, well, and, movie and also that's not that level of inspiration, right? I mean, that mm -hmm. was trying to do something different mm -hmm. with with Pokemon and sort of sort of for the mainline stuff. I mean, Game Freak in their actual Pokemon games tends to be, I, I mean, beyond ultra conservative. They make almost exactly the same game every single time. I mean, it's beat for beat identical. Uh, there is, I mean, it's it's just almost mechanical, and you just see the the pain of the longtime fans' uh, posts as they say, "Come on, can't you give us something a little more here?" But no, they cannot, and they will not. Um, you know, there have been you know, some, we've some given of the you thirty one new Pokemon. What more do you want <laughs> right. from us? I don't think it's a cannot; it's the will not. Right. They have different shoes. Mm. Look, the shoes are totally different. So, I mean, you know, some of the spinoffs like the Pokemon Mystery Dungeon or the uh, or the crossover with uh, Nobunaga's Ambition, which was actually pretty cool. Um, yeah, so, I, I mean, they, they could do a lot with it, uh, and but this is very much the, the standard approach. There are going to be exactly zero... Uh, 
uh, innovations taken. It has to be utterly, utterly mechanically identical to everything that's come before. And sort of the, this, this remake approach fits in with that uh, distressingly closely. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, for some reason, if you are interested, um, I have three links for you. One to Netflix, one to the wiki, one to ANN. Uh, oglink.com slash 5QK, 5QL, and 5QM. Alrighty. I don't know. Is there anything else we wanted to cover? I think the only thing that's disappointing is that uh, Kyle's version of of the opening wasn't the opening. <laughs> yeah, that that was uh, not a cunning cover of the, no, uh, of no, the main no, theme. No, It was terrible. Terrible. Uh, and I uh, I just love Kyle's version. That's why yeah. I played it up front. Um, so you know, like some part of me is like. You know, any any new movie that doesn't include that is, you know, someone should reach out to him and like what is what is Survivor doing these days? We we need to like get them back into the studio to like cover the Pokemon theme. That's that's the people who could do it, you know, really good job. Yeah. So uh it, it was mm, unimpressive. Uh, <laughs> okay. So that being said, uh I guess I guess it's it's time to wrap up the show unless there's something else to cover. Is there any other particular things we, we need to cover? Yep, I think that's it. I mean, you know, there's not a lot of reason to watch this. I mean, uh, it is a, an, an okay piece of entertainment. I mean, you'd be better served by playing a Pokemon game. Your kids might like this. I mean, it is watch flashy. It's movie. got lots of Pokemon. I mean, you know. Or watch the, and, the original movie. Yeah, watch, watch the original movie if mm -hmm. you're into Pokemon, honestly. Yeah, but I mean, at this point, I would expect if you're a fan of Pokemon, you probably already have. Mm -hmm. So, okay, with that said, let's let's close things up. Um, so, for all things we've mentioned, please visit our website, www.talkgeneration.net or ognetworks.tv. Come and hang out with us in Discord. You can do that at oglink.com slash Discord or feedback if you want to leave feedback. Um, you can email us. We still have an email. Uh, most people do. Uh, Ataku.generation at gmail.com. Uh, you want to become a, a patron, you can do that. OGLink.com slash Patreon. Okay. I got... Guys can all hear the noise up close and personal. <laughs> okay. Ah, all right. What do I got here? Oh, this one's kind of long. I'm just going to read it. Losers visualize the penalties of failure. Winners visualize the reward of success. That's it. That's the, that's the air quotes fortune. In addition to being hard to parse in name, and uh, I have to say, not a fortune. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was waiting for. That's what I'm always waiting for. All right, I'm going to take a picture of that. Thank you, everyone, for, uh, for listening. And uh, I don't know if you thought our opinions about Pokemon were wrong or this movie was wrong. You know how to get a hold of us. God, I gave you a couple options. Uh, we're still in the thing, so please stay home, please stay safe, and please stay healthy. And until next week, everyone, have a good one. See you then. Bye.